He is the image of the invisible God. The firstborn of all creation. For by him all things were created. In heaven and on earth. Visible and invisible. Whether thrones or dominions or rulers or authorities. All things were created through him and for him. And he is before all things. And in him all things hold together. Well, we've been hearing those words uh, for five weeks or so, the words you just heard on that little video. And uh, Pastor Jeff has been challenging us to try to memorize those couple of verses because we're in this series on Colossians. So I want to see how you're doing today. We did this a couple of weeks ago, and you, so you recognize the verses I put them up there with some blanks. I've extended the blanks this time. Do we have the, do we have the verses? There we go. Uh, and I've extended them to see, see how much you can remember. So I'm going to lead us through, so just... See what your brain comes up with. See if you remember. Ready? Here we go. He is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn of all creation. For by him all things were made in heaven and on earth, visible and invisible, right? Whether thrones or dominions or rulers or authorities. Good. Stay with it. All things were created through him. And for him, I always want to say by as well, but through him and for him, and he is before all things, and in him all things hold together. Good job. And it's, that's a mouthful. That's a, those, those are mind-bending things. But if you have to remember anything, remember that last line. Jesus is before all things, and in him all things hold together. Well, years ago, um, when our four boys were very young, um, my wife and I were going out somewhere some night, I no longer remember what, and we got a babysitter. And just as the babysitter got to our house and we were giving her instructions, two of our boys, uh, I don't remember which two, got into some sort of tussle. You know, if you're a parent, you know that happens. Right as the babysitter comes in, things go haywire, and it's kind of embarrassing, but we heard wailing coming from another part of the house. So we go over to see what's happening, and one's wailing, one's standing next to him looking guilty. So I said, okay, what happened? And the one who's wailing said, he whacked me. So I looked at the alleged whacker, and I said, did you whack him? Why'd you whack him? Took my toy, something like that. And I said, is that what you're supposed to do? What are you supposed to do? Use my words. <laughs> okay, now what do you say to your brother for whacking him? And he looked at his brother and said, I forgive you. <laughs> was a right idea, poor execution, but eventually, eventually we got it right, got the words right, and this whole time the babysitter is watching this. And then she said, when we cleared it up, she said, wow, that would never happen at my house. No one ever says they're sorry. And that got my attention because she came from a church family, and I realized I'd either discovered the very first perfect family in human history, or... What they talked about and believed on Sundays didn't make it into their home Monday through Saturday. Now, we're in uh, the fifth week of a study on the book of Colossians in the New Testament uh, called All Things. And uh, Sterling and Jeff and I have been talking over this last month or so as we've done these, these weeks of sermons that studying Colossians has been kind of like visiting the Grand Canyon. How many of you have been to the Grand Canyon? A lot of you? Some of you? Okay. Well, then you know that uh, no matter what you expect it to be, no matter how many uh, photographs you've seen of the Grand Canyon, when you finally see it, it's just overwhelming in size, scope, and beauty. Each view is more spectacular than the one before. Um, in fact, my, one of my sons and I visited a couple of years ago, uh, kind of a bucket list trip, and we saw this breathtaking uh, spectacle, and with each view just uh, being better than the one before, and just to prove that I was actually there myself with my son, uh, throw this picture up there. Oh, sorry. I, I didn't follow the script there. But yeah, I was there too. <laughs> we kind of set up that picture. But it's kind of like Colossians. If you read through that, uh, the memory verses and uh, the first chapter or so, that's the feeling I get. He is the image of the invisible God. Whoa, that's kind of mind-bending. He's the firstborn of all creation. Jesus is before all things, and in him all things hold together. Whoa, that's amazing. Jesus is the wisdom and the mystery of God. 
made known. No longer do we have to wonder uh, who put it all together. No, no longer do we have to wonder what God is like. We can see because Jesus has made that known. More than that, Jesus has canceled our sin, Paul says, nailing it to the cross. And even more than that, if that were not enough, not only does he give us a new heart by forgiving our sin and taking it away, he gives us even a new identity, which means we are no longer identified by our culture or by our race or by our education or our success, even by our failures and our sins. We are now identified as children of God, chosen, adopted, loved, made new. And because we are now identified with and by Christ, Paul says we can put off the old self. We can put off what we used to be, and we can put on what he calls the new self. And that's what Sterling was teaching on last Sunday. Let me read just a quick portion of what he dealt with last Sunday, Colossians chapter 3. Paul writes, Put on, then, as God's chosen ones, holy and beloved, compassionate hearts, kindness, humility, meekness, and patience. I put those words in red just so you can see them. Bearing with one another, and if one has a complaint against another, forgiving each other, as the Lord has forgiven you, so you must also forgive. And above all else, and above all these, put on love, which binds everything together in perfect harmony. So that's what our new life in Christ looks like, Paul says. Compassion, kindness, humility, meekness, patience, forgiveness, love. It's pretty good stuff. I mean, who would not want those characteristics growing in their own lives and relationships? Who would not want that? But here's the thing. Paul is saying, if you are a believer in Christ, a follower of Christ, God says, that's who you already are in him. That is your identity now in him. You are all those things. Now, if you're like me, as you, we've gone through these weeks, you've been sort of amazed and your mind has sort of been challenged by these, these lofty theological teachings and maybe even like me wondering, when's, when's, okay, when's he going to get practical? I understand all this theology is important, but when's he going to get practical? What difference does it make for where I really live? Well, that's what Paul does now. He shifts gears rather suddenly, and he wants us to see what the gospel looks like in the central relationships of our lives, where we live most of our lives. Three areas he's going to talk about. Marriage, family, and work. Colossians chapter 3 is our text for today. Let me read these verses, beginning in verse 18. He says, Wives, submit to your husbands as is fitting in the Lord. Husbands, love your wives and do not be harsh with them. Children, Obey your parents in everything, for this pleases the Lord. Fathers, do not provoke your children, lest they become discouraged. Bond servants, obey in everything those who are your earthly masters, not by way of eye service as people pleasers, but with sincerity of heart, fearing the Lord. Whatever you do, work heartily as for the Lord and not for men, knowing that from the Lord you will receive the inheritance as your reward. You are serving the Lord Christ. For the wrongdoer will be paid back for the wrong he has done, and there is no partiality. Masters, treat your bondservants justly and fairly, knowing that you have also a master in heaven. So let's break this down now. The first thing he talks about is the gospel for marriage. What does the gospel look like in marriage? Uh, back when our boys were younger, uh, close to the time of the story I told before, when they were in elementary school or so, they're at that age where they're kind of figuring out how the world works figuring out how authority works in school, with teachers and so forth, and even at home. And we're at the dinner table one night, and out of nowhere, one of our boys, I no longer remember which one, uh, pipes up and says, right in the middle of dinner, um, who's the boss of our family? <laughs> and immediately, all four boys and my wife look right at me. Uh, and I wasn't really prepared to take on that particular question at that time, wasn't anticipating it. And so I, I, I formulated quickly, as I recall, something like this. Well, 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 a boss isn't really the word I would use um, for that. Uh, but as dad, I'm the one responsible for our family, so I'm supposed to be the leader. And I, before I even finished that answer, another son jumped in and said, so, well, so if you're the boss, what's mom? <laughs> Question got harder. Um, <laughs> and I was preparing a, sort of a, a uh, biblical answer they could understand in my head. I was going to explain that, you know, I, even though I'm responsible and I'm the leader, mom and I are partners in this thing and we're mutually responsible. Before I could even finish that, the one who started the whole thing piped up and said, I know, I know, mom's the queen, he said. 
And so I just left it right there. <laughs> Colossians 3.18, Paul says, Wives, submit yourselves to your husbands as is fitting in the Lord. Husbands, love your wives and do not be harsh with them. Now, to our ears, if we're all honest, that sounds kind of out of touch with where we live in the modern world. We hear a word like submit, and we think, really? Really, what kind of Neanderthal writes that, right? And many people say, that's why I don't believe what's in this old book. But before we run down that road, let me back up a bit. Because in ancient Roman culture, it was all uh, organized and built around this concept that, that we now call the pater familias, father of the family in Latin. It meant the oldest uh, male in the household, usually the husband or father, sometimes grandfather, had absolute authority. His wife and children were considered to be his legal property. If his children disobeyed him or angered him, he had the legal right under the law to disown them, sell them into slavery, even kill them if he chose to and he could not be prosecuted for it. Now, that, the killing part hardly ever happened, uh, but he still had the legal right to. In fact, the pater familias had the right to decide whether to keep a newborn child or not. The child was born, a midwife would lay the child on the ground, and if that father wanted that child, he would pick it up. If he didn't pick it up, they would abandon the child and do what, they call, what was called exposure, just leave the child to die. Interestingly enough, the early Christian community would find these children and would adopt them and raise them because of their high view of the value of every human life. Now, so when we understand that historical and cultural context, we can see that Paul is actually saying things here in these verses that are revolutionary to the understanding of marriage. So we have to look at these two sets of instructions kind of simultaneously. Two words. First, the word submit. He says, wives, submit to your husbands as is fitting in the Lord. Now, the word submit there means to voluntarily come under the leadership of another. And then he uses the word love. Husbands, love your wives and do not be harsh with them. Now, the word love there is this great New Testament verb, agapeo, from the noun agape. You've probably heard that. This is the word used most often in the New Testament to describe the love of God for us, agape. It means to seek the welfare of another. It means to prize or treasure another, to love another sacrificially. That's what that verb means. So let me give you a little illustration. Uh, a few years ago, I traveled to Turkey with a group from Chapel Street, and uh, while we were there, we were visiting a city, and while we were coming back uh, toward our hotel, I happened to notice a scene unfold across the street. Uh, there was a man and, and a woman walking. I, I understood them to be husband and wife. Uh, he was wearing a dark suit, a hat in a typical cultural way, and she was walking behind him, about three steps behind him, wearing a full-length black uh, covering and had a head covering on. And so he's walking, and she's walking behind him on the street, and she's carrying an umbrella. It started to rain. So we, we had we were uh, stepping out of our bus right when it started to rain. And the man who was walking in front stopped, reached back, and his wife took the umbrella that she was carrying, and then she opened it. She handed it to him. He took it, put it over his head. He kept walking, and she walked behind him in the rain. I just watched it happen really quickly right in front of me. And I thought to myself, hmm, I know that's cultural. That's kind of a cultural thing. Uh, but that's kind of what Paul's talking about. That's the pater familias culture where the man has all the authority, all the privilege, all the rights, and the woman, the wife, has none. And Paul says, say, and you say, no. No, 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 no. The gospel changes all of that. Husbands, you are to love your wives. And that kind of love demands that you look out for her well-being at your own cost. That means that you take the umbrella and you hold it over her head so that she stays dry. That's what that love means. Wives, you are to voluntarily come under the umbrella of your husband's provision and care. Now, you need to understand, this would be a radical concept in that day, revolutionary, because husbands and fathers in that culture had absolute and unquestioned authority. They were not compelled to love. They were empowered to rule. That's what Paul is saying is revolutionary. Uh, some years ago, a woman came to see me in my office for a counseling appointment, and very quickly, it, it became obvious she needed to talk about some very uncomfortable things happening in her marriage. So my standard procedure is to say, well, before you talk about any of that, I need to make sure that 
your husband knows you're talking to me about this because, or else it's inappropriate. So she said, no, he knows I'm coming to see you. I said, make sure he knows. I want to hear his side of the story. So she talked to me, and then the very next day I got a phone call from her husband, who was angry. I mean, angry. He demanded that I do my job and, and tell his wife to submit to his authority. I said, well, what do you mean by I need to do my job? And he quoted the Bible to me. He said, it says, it says right there, it says right there in Colossians that wives submit to your husbands. She's not submitting. You should tell her to follow God's word and submit to me. And I said, okay, hold on a second, hold on a second. Can you tell me what the next verse says? Silence. I said, let me read it for you. The next verse says, husbands, love your wives and do not be harsh with them. Let me just ask you, sir, how are you doing with that one? Crickets. And then hang up. Right? In his letter to the Ephesian church, which was sort of the mother church to the Colossian church, they weren't very far apart. Remember, Epaphras came from the Ephesian church to start the church in Colossae. So Paul writes to the Ephesians, and he goes deeper into this relationship between a submission, submit, and love. He writes in Ephesians chapter 5, submit to one another out of reverence for Christ. So the marriage is sort of a mutual submission to one another. And then that submission reveals itself in two different ways. He says, wives... Submit yourselves to your own husbands as you do to the Lord. For the husband is the head of the wife as Christ is head of the church, his body of which he is the Savior. So respect the leadership. Be willing to walk under the umbrella that your husband provides. Then he says, husbands, love your wives. How? Just as Christ loved the church and gave himself up for her. You love sacrificially, giving your life for her well-being. In the same way, husbands ought to love their wives as their own bodies. He who loves his wife loves himself. After all, no one ever hated their own body, but they feed and care for the body just as Christ does the church. For we are members of his body. For this reason, a man will leave his father and mother and be united to his wife, and the two will become one flesh. That's a quote from the book of Genesis. This is a profound mystery, but I'm talking about Christ and the church. However, each one of you also must love his wife as he loves himself, and the wife must respect her husband. So, What's he saying about the gospel for marriage? Marriage is to reflect the relationship between Christ and his church. That is, the husband is to love his wife with a love that is sacrificial, giving of himself, and the wife is to respond to that love with respect and to voluntarily walk under the umbrella. And that's why the church is described as the bride of Christ. That's why the whole Bible ends in the book of Revelation with something called the wedding supper of the Lamb. Heaven itself described as a celebration of the wedding and the marriage between Christ and his church. Paul says the gospel is for marriage. Secondly, he says the gospel is for families. It's for families. Uh, back in my uh, student ministry days here at Chapel Street, I used to lead a high school Bible study on Wednesday nights in a rented facility. We'd have 50 or 60 students, and we would do some teachings in small groups, and we'd always end with a little prayer time. And I would ask to ask the, invite the students to share any prayer concern they, they had. And I'd usually get, you know, pray for my grandma. She's, she's uh, struggling with health, or pray for a test I have coming up, or something like that. And one night we were doing that, and one kid who was brand new, it had only been once, maybe twice, raised a hand. I was kind of surprised because usually new kids didn't raise their hand for prayer. But he raised his hand. I said, yeah, what do you got? And he said, uh, can you, um, can you uh, pray I won't get grounded? Uh, that's a story there. So I said, uh, can you share a little bit more with me? And so he told the story. He said that the day before, the very day before, he and a buddy, a friend of his, had stayed out past curfew, the curfew their parents had set. And they figured since they were already in trouble, they just wouldn't go home at all. So they stayed out all night long. Went to school that day, which was a Wednesday. After school, they stayed out. And then he came straight to Bible study. And after Bible study, he was going home. And he knew his parents would be angry. And he was asking me to pray that they wouldn't get grounded. I said, oh, okay. Um, thanks for sharing that. Uh, thanks for sharing. But I don't think I can pray that. The room got real quiet. He looked kind of confused. I said, I, I don't think I can pray that. Here's what I think I can pray. I said, I can pray this, that you will have the humility to go home today and that you'll apologize to your parents for disregarding their boundaries and disrespecting them, and that you'll submit yourself to whatever discipline they think is appropriate. That's what I can pray. Can I pray that for you? <laughs> and he went, uh, okay. Uh, <laughs> that's what I prayed. Colossians 3.20 says, Children, obey your parents in everything, for this pleases the Lord. Fathers, do not provoke your children, lest they become discouraged. Again, notice two sets of instructions 
first to children, then to fathers. And that word could be translated parents, and not just the males, parents. And remember the context here. The, con the spiritual context is new life in Christ. What does our new life in Christ look like? The cultural context is pater familias. The parent, the father figure has all the authority. So for children, the issue here is authority. Obey your parents, for this pleases the Lord. Now, you need to know that in that culture, obedience was totally expected. Nothing surprising there. Obey the pater familias. That's how it works. Children were property of the father, and therefore they had to obey. But the surprising thing here added, that we can miss it, is the motivation to obey. Why should they obey? Because it pleases the Lord. Not just because the Father has the authority, but because it pleases the Lord. Now here, there's another revolutionary thing here, which is what, which is what Paul says to the fathers or the parents. He says, do not provoke your children. That word provoke means do not arouse to anger. One translation says embitter. Do not embitter your children. The issue here is the manner in which authority is exercised. So it's not obey or I'm going to disown you, obey or I'm going to sell you into slavery, but rather it implies a relationship of nurture and care. So how do parents embitter their children? I could talk about a lot of ways. Let me just talk about three ways that I think are common. First, we embitter our children when we fail to pay attention. This might be called neglect. Failing to pay attention. Uh, years ago, again, I was hanging out with some high school kids on a trip, and toward the end of the day, they were all sitting around eating, eating pizza, and they got to talking about parents. And sometimes when, the, when I was around high school kids, they would kind of forget that I was an adult, and they would just talk about their parents, and surprisingly positive things they were saying about their parents. They were just talking about the goofy things their parents do and so forth. And one kid didn't say anything the whole time as we were talking. And finally, after a while, this young man, 17 years old, his name was David, he said, I'll never forget it, he said, my old man cares more about his lawn than he does me. He went on to say his father didn't know um, uh, how he was doing in school, his father didn't come to his cross-country meets, but his father took a lot of care with the lawn. His father cared about the grass. What he was talking about was attention. Failure to pay attention provokes and embitters because failure to pay attention is a failure to love. Secondly, we embitter when we fail to discipline. Failure to discipline. At that same um, high school Bible study in those days, uh, sometime after the first story, uh, a group of students were hanging out after we're all done with prayer time, and they got to talking about curfew. Kids love to talk about curfew. One was saying, oh, my curfew's 10 o'clock. One said, my curfew's 10.30. Mine's 11 on weekends. And after all this discussion, one kid uh, pipes up and says, I don't have a curfew. And the whole conversation stopped. They said, really? He goes, no, I don't have a curfew. My parents don't care what time I come home. I can stay out all night tonight if I want to. And the other students are going, oh, that's amazing. That's awesome. Your parents must be awesome. But I knew something about that kid. I knew that when he said my parents don't care, he meant that literally. His parents both struggled with addiction to alcohol and drugs, and they really didn't care what he did. And he was craving their discipline. He was craving their attention. He was craving their love. Failure to set boundaries Failure to discipline is a failure to love. And thirdly, I would mention the pressure to achieve. I don't know how it was in Paul's day. I assume it was something like it is in our day. But in our world, I think children increasingly feel enormous pressure to achieve. To achieve. Many of our children, I think, struggle with feelings of, of failure. Like they're not keeping up with their peers. They're not being good enough. I think that's one of the impacts of social media in our culture. Uh, kids look on Instagram or on Facebook and they see everybody else's life and how awesome it looks and they have this deep sense that they're falling behind that somehow their life doesn't measure up. And if you add to that the expectations of parents for straight A's, varsity this, varsity that, college scholarship, sometimes we provoke and we embitter our children when we push them to achieve so that we can feel like successful as parents. It's a scourge in our culture, I think. See, our primary job as parents is not to produce successful children. It's not to produce achievement in our children. Our primary job as parents is, is to make sure our children know who they are in God's eyes, who they are in Christ. Paul says the gospel is for families. Thirdly, he says the gospel is also for work. The gospel is for work. Verse 22, bond servants, I'm going to explain that word in a minute, obey in everything those who are your earthly masters. Not by way of eye service as people pleasers, but with sincerity of heart, fearing the Lord. 
Whatever you do, work heartily as for the Lord and not for men, knowing that from the Lord you will receive the inheritance as your reward. You are serving the Lord Christ. For the wrongdoer will be paid back for the wrong he has done, and there is no partiality. Masters, treat your bondservants justly and fairly, knowing that you also have a master in heaven. Once again, two sets of instructions to two groups of people. He says to bondservants and to masters. Now to understand what he's saying here, we've got to understand the culture just a little bit. Uh, the word translated bond servants is the word doulos in Greek, which can be translated as slave. And that word just sort of sets us off. We recoil from it, and rightfully so. Forced slavery is a terrible thing. We ought to fight to eliminate forced slavery from the world. But that's not really what Paul's talking about here. Uh, the word translated should be translated more as bond servant because he's referring to someone who willingly lives under authority. See, a bond servant in that culture was one who had willingly become the servant of another for the purpose of financial survival or personal survival, sort of like a household servant or employee. And we might, in our culture, think of the employee-employer relationship. Like for today, today, if you have a job, uh, you give yourself to your employer for so many hours a week in return for so much money. It's an arrangement. In a way, you become a bond servant. When you're at work, your time and your energy don't belong to you. They belong to your employer. That's what Paul's talking about. Then he also talks to, talks to masters. The word for masters is the word kyrios, which is most clearly translated as Lord. It's the same word used for Lord Jesus, kyrios, Jesus. And the kyrios master is the one for whom the doulos, bondservant, works and serves. So Paul's saying the gospel impacts work in two ways. First, it impacts the responsibility of the employee or the bondservant. Obey your earthly master. Obey your boss. In other words, do your job. But more than that, notice, here's the surprise. Understand that now, because of your new identity in Christ, you aren't just working to please your earthly boss so that he or she thinks highly of you and gives you a raise. You're actually working for the Lord, he says. You're working for a higher authority. Therefore, your work should exceed expectations. And then he speaks to the responsibility of the, of the master, the employer, the boss. And this also would have been a surprise in that culture. He says, your, your responsibility is to provide what is just and fair for those who work for you. They need to be treated with justice because you too have a master in heaven and you will be held accountable for how you treat those who work for you. So, what's the gospel at work? Employees, you have a new identity in Christ. Employers, you also have a new identity in Christ. And that new identity, compassion, kindness, humility, patience, forgiveness, love, is to change both the way you work and the way you treat those who work for you. We say all the time here at Chapel Street, I said it earlier today, that we believe God wants each one of us to experience grace, grow in faith, and make an impact right where we are. Here's a question. Where are you most of the time in your life? Are you here in church? No. I mean, it's good to be here, and Paul at later places does talk about our behavior, how we treat each other in the church community, but this is like the easiest place for me to be, place for me to be like Christ, right? This is the easiest place. You know, I can be nice here and friendly and smile for an hour or so, right? You can do the same thing, dress up, look nice, go to church. But this isn't where we live all the time. Where do we live? Marriage, family, and work. That's why Paul talks about the impact of the gospel where we live. And it's much more difficult to maintain that identity in those places than it is right here in church. Years ago, when our boys were younger again, I was doing something important like, um, like watching a playoff game or something <laughs> on TV. And one of my boys came running in. He was about five years old, came running in. He had a scraped knee, you know, scraped, scraped bloody knee. So I, I, I left the game temporarily and went into the bathroom, dug out the first aid kit, found a Band-Aid, and put it on his scraped knee. And just as I finished that little bit of triage and was going back to my important thing, our two-year-old was upstairs he witnessed that, and he starts crying out, 
Daddy, I need a Band-Aid. And I knew that he didn't need a Band-Aid, so I yelled back up, you don't need a Band-Aid. I need a Band-Aid. I knew he just wanted a Band-Aid because his older brother got a Band-Aid, so I said, you don't need a Band-Aid. He cried out again, I need a Band-Aid. I'm trying to watch the game. Right? So I, I came up with my argument back. I yelled up, is there blood? <laughs> Quiet for a moment. And then comes a disappointed little voice back. No. <laughs> then you don't need a Band-Aid. Case closed. Back to the game. Right? And then he just started to cry. Just whimpering upstairs. <sighs> I, I dawned on me that maybe, just maybe, what was hurting my son, the little one, was not a scraped knee at all, but kind of, a, kind of a heart thing. He was wondering, does his daddy love him the same way he loved the older one, and would I pay the same attention to him as I did the older one? <sighs> Sometimes it's harder at home, right? <laughs> so I got up, went in, found another Band-Aid, went up and put that Band-Aid on a perfectly fine knee. What's the gospel look like in marriage? What's it look like at home, in families? What's the gospel look like at work? Compassion, kindness, patience, humility, forgiveness, love, that's what Paul says. Looks a lot like Jesus. Looks a lot like Jesus. Let's close in prayer. Lord, we thank you for your word. For this ancient letter that really is so contemporary in so many ways. And we thank you for reminding us that the gospel is not just a set of religious rules that we try to keep. It's not a collection of spiritual ideas. But it's the power to transform. To shift our identity. To make a difference where we really live. In our marriages, in our families. And where we work. And how we work. So by your spirit... May we be who you say we are, wherever we are. And it's in your name that we pray.